2A, fictitious payees, segregation of duties, and the importance of bank reconciliations. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's the Facebook page, the website, and some other information I'll cover at the end here. Unfortunately, uh, the item I want to talk about today is one of the most egregious examples of fraud that I use as, as an auditing example for fraud that I've ever seen. So I'm going to jump over to the website. So what I've done here is jump over to my website. Here is the page that says the blog Accounting Accidentally. And as many of you have seen, I have an RSS feed that loads my blogs automatically and you can, have, you can in fact scroll them. So the one I'm going to pull up is segregation of duties and fictitious payee. What this application does is take us into blogger.com where I have my blog posts. And you'll see it coming up in just a minute. So here's the blog post, Segregation of Duties and the Fictitious Payee. I have done another Auditing 2 video on this, but this example was so egregious and so large in terms of dollars, I thought it was a good one. And I start off in the first paragraph talking about there's a common misconception about what an auditor does, and if you look at the audit opinion language, you'll see what I mean. It's in the middle paragraph, the scope paragraph. The auditor is giving assurance that the financial statements are free of material misstatement. An audit is not designed to detect fraud. So we talk about in the next paragraph, well, what is fraud? Fraud is willful intent to deceive. It has to be willful or intentional. Another word that's on the auditing section of the CPA quite a bit is collusion. If two or more people collude to go around the company's internal controls and commit fraud, all the accounting procedures in the world may not catch the fraud. If you're a baseball fan, back in the uh, 70s, the baseball owners were accused of collusion to work together to keep down player salaries, as an example. Now, in addition to that free of material mistake in the audit opinion, there's also language in most audit opinions that uh, maybe we took a look at internal controls, which is what the segregation of duties addresses. There's an assumption that internal, internal controls will be followed by management and that those controls are reliable. Now, the degree to which they're reliable uh, is a story for another day. That's part of the process you do during an audit is test the reliability of internal controls for yourself as an auditor. Another theme here is is that the more transactions you have in a particular area, the more risk you have. Now, there's two types of risks. The first is there's a risk that an employee will make an unintentional mistake. They post it to the wrong GL account. The problem, though, in terms of fraud is an area that has more transactions makes it harder to uncover the fraud because it's easier to hide, particularly if that transaction is a small one. So I say that's because there's more noise, more transactions make the intentionally, remember fraud means intention, make the intentionally fraudulent transaction less noticeable. And so now we get to the three duties that we ideally would like to s segregate or separate. Now, we do understand that, <coughs> excuse me, in most companies that have just a few employees, it may not be possible to segregate these duties. So let me just put that out there first. You improve your chances of preventing fraud if you segregate these duties between different people. And the example that I usually use to explain segregation of duties is cash because it's something somebody can get their arms around quickly. Okay. Number one, custody of assets, physical custody of the assets. Who has the checkbook if you're talking about cash? Who has access to the keys to the equipment room if employees sign out equipment to use on the job like plumbers or carpenters or electricians? Number two, authority over assets. Who has the authority to move the asset, to move it out and use it, for example. From a cash perspective, that's the person who can sign the check for equipment. Who can sign out the equipment? Um, I've had experiences in the trades, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, subcontractors, 
problems of employees taking home equipment over the weekend or at night to do jobs on the side with the company's equipment and it doesn't get returned. The third one applies to any type of business and that is who is handling the accounting entries, person C. Somebody's making the accounting entries for every transaction regardless of where it is on the balance sheet or the income statement. And what I say in the paragraph wrapping up below, if any one person has two or more of these duties, bad things can happen. If that person decides to commit fraud and they have two or more duties, uncovering it will be hard. It may take years to detect. And that brings us to um, this frankly incredible case in Dixon, Illinois, which is near where I am in St. Louis. I have a link there to the article. If you go to the blog, you can click on it. So we have a massive fraud that took place because duties weren't segregated. Former bookkeeper steals $53 million from her Illinois community, city bookkeeper. $53 million over 20 years. That's what, 1.7 a year in theft for a community that's not very big and doesn't have a very big budget. She used the siphon money to pay for properties, vacation homes, luxury cars, and a horse breeding operation. Now, I think a common sense tip-off would be, if I was in Dixon, Illinois, why is it that the controller, the bookkeeper for the city, is accumulating this massive wealth? Why is that happening? That's a, usually a tip-off for somebody who's committing fraud is uh, they start to live far beyond their means and um, the income doesn't match up with the lifestyle they're living. Apparently, this was ignored. So how did this individual get away with it? Well, she had sole control over the city's finances. That implies that she's got authority, she's got custody of the assets, and she's the record keeper. If they say sole authority, that's what that implies. She would hide her theft behind fictitious invoices for things like municipal sewer projects. I'm going to explain fictitious payee in a minute. And she's spending money on all kinds of stuff. Now, she was depositing money in a secret bank account that she controlled for more than 20 years until the FBI began monitoring her transactions. Now, the next comment here is exactly the same situation that I saw 22 years ago when I was on an audit. The situation began to unravel when she was when she was sent, I think there's a typo there, on an extended vacation and the person filling in for her stumbled upon the secret account. So the scam works as long as the person committing the fraud maintains control and if somebody else starts to look at it, questions are going to be asked. So it's a classic case of fictitious payee. So let's talk about specifically what the auditor, the controller, excuse me, was able to do. She opened an account with a company name and address controlled by her. Now it may sound like a legitimate company. Oftentimes it's a name, the name of the company is close to a legitimate company you do business with and that makes it even harder to notice. She was able to write checks from city accounts that were payable to the fictitious company. So she's got authority to create an invoice, she's got authority to write a check and sign it, and then she's got authority to post accounting entries to the records, which implied that the payments were legitimate because she's posting them as expenses. She controls everything. Now one way this could have been caught is by somebody reconciling a bank account. And maybe what happened when she took, when the fraud person took the extended vacation was, is that somebody who took over the job started noticing large amounts of checks paid to a company that nobody had ever heard of and nobody had seen them, that company delivering any sort of product or service. And the question becomes, why are we making all these payments and what are we paying for? That bank reconciler might, reconciler might ask. And then I go through again um, how the duties were not segregated and how this whole thing could have been prevented if one of the three would have been given a responsibility to somebody else. A separate party reconciling the bank account, last sentence, the accounting records, may have been able to catch the fraud and prevent it going forward. Um, there's an article here about the legal, 
with the legal fallout. There was an audit done, it appears, if you go to the, um, the Dixon, Illinois website, which you can Google, it appears to me that there was an audit done every year. Uh, this article here mentions the auditors who are being sued. And there, are, I didn't go through all of it, but there is some discussion of the auditors writing up something on internal control. I didn't take the time to see exactly what they did, signed off on, or didn't sign off on. But it's you can go to the Dixon, Illinois website and look at the financials, and you can also go to this article. So, an amazing example of a fictitious payee that was finally caught. That's as far as we're going to get on auditing two. The website, you can see that we do one-on-one -on -one live tutoring online. We have additional videos and Excel spreadsheets not on the, not on the web. Here's our Facebook pay page. We teach the book, Cost Accounting for Dummies, in a free online course each week. The book comes out March 4th, 2013, and you saw the blog. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you next time.